this is going to be a uh, rehash of a presentation I gave to my coworkers. Uh, we use Git, uh, obviously, at work, and we use it in kind of a weird way. And um, we found that when we brought new developers on, it took them a little bit of time to get up to speed on using Git. And um, I noticed one thing when I was learning Git, uh, which was that um, people who have gotten over that Git learning curve, they start to say things along the lines of, um, you know, Git really makes a lot more sense when you, um, when you finally understand Foo. Um, and I found that that was not terribly helpful. Um, and I found myself saying things like that to a friend of mine who then gave me the feedback that, yeah, you said that too, and a lot of other people said that, and I didn't really get it until I uh, had that same epiphany myself. So I, I sat down to think about what the perspective was that made Git finally make sense to me, and this is what came out of that. Um, so, uh, Git makes more sense when you understand X. Um, I did a quick uh, search for that, came up with 8 million results. Um, this was one of my favorite ones. This was Kent Beck um, last year, actually earlier this year, finally figuring out the Git commands were doing graph manipulation stuff. And I thought this was awesome for two reasons. One, because it was a great example of this statement of the form, Git makes much more sense when you understand X. And two, because I read, I've read several of Kent's books, and he's great, and it just flabbergasted me that I had understood something before he did. <laughs> um, and that was really cool. Uh, this was the other other awesome one that I came across. Um, home of Mapping <laughs> 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 yeah. some manifolds of a Hilbert space. This is great. Uh, I have no idea what the fuck that means. <laughs> talk to my coworkers, and I hope that some of you will, will take this away as well, um, was that um, once you understand where the pointy bits are in Git, um, and you understand what they do for you, um, you can get a lot more comfortable using Git without feeling like you're going to chop your leg off. Um, and more kittens. Uh, so Git is obscure, it also is ridiculously powerful, there's a reason so many of us use it. Um, most of that power, I find, comes from the way that Git looks at your code and the history of your code. Um, and that's not really Git, that is a computer science thing and it can be taught. And once you understand that, again, Git becomes much easier to use. Um, this is a great quote from a couple years ago about, about uh, Git Rebase Interactive. This is from a wonderful um, article by Ryan Tomeko that you should all go and read. Um, these slides are all online, um, and I can uh, show the link at the end. Um, its power comes from the way computer scientists see the world. It's surprisingly easy to think about, and I could. <laughs> Okay, um, I wrote this for a number of coworkers who uh, do not have computer science backgrounds. I expect you guys to get this, at least some of you guys to get this fairly quickly, um, but it's the same set of slides, so I'll just run through them. This is the neighborhood where I live in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's fantastic. Lots of trees, and everybody gets lost because it's not on the grid. Um, some friends of mine have called this the vortex of Portland. <laughs> um, nearby, there's a bridge. Um, Here's a drawing of Konigsberg, Prussia, a family tree, social network, uh, really fun graph they generated at um, Facebook a while back, showing connections between cities. Um, some sort of sporting event, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> Not in my milieu. Um, and a fun screenshot from uh, Visual Thesaurus, which is a really uh, fun little thing to load up at parties if you load it up 10 minutes beforehand because it's a job. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so things that these things have, uh, so what these things have in common. Um, 
I decided to run through these slides again with some helpful graphics overlaid on them. Here's my neighborhood again. Um, here is the Morrison Bridge, Konigsberg, Prussia, family tree, social networks, local party to Facebook, sporting event, visual thesaurus. Um, the things that these things have in common are one, that they all have places to be, and two, they have ways to get between them. Um, for anybody who's not had it through science, uh, degree, uh, we call that graph theory. Um, this is a screenshot from the Wikipedia entry on graph theory. Um, I'm scared by the math. Um, or as a friend of mine, as a coworker of mine put it, all I heard was nerd, nerd, nerd. <laughs> <laughs> um, a graph is a collection of nodes and a collection of edges that connect, uh, each edge connects two nodes. Nodes basically are places to be, edges are ways to get between them, and that's all you need to know. Um, the history of graph theory uh, goes back to the 18th century. As I was told the story, and this may be apocryphal, um, but as I was told the story, there was a favorite pastime of people with money and time uh, to try to walk through the city of Konigsberg and cross every bridge, of which there were seven, exactly one time. Um, can't be done. And this guy, Leonard Euler, uh, who's famous among mathematicians, uh, wrote this paper and basically invented graph theory. Um, I said I was going to talk about it, and uh, this is the tie-in. This is the perspective that uh, I wanted to share. Um, Git commands are really about working with graphs. Uh, second. Going through those uh, pictures that I had before in a different order, uh, we have nodes that are places to be, um, edges are ways to get between them. I have some examples. Konigsberg, Prussia, this is um, the original graph theory problem. Uh, the thing that I really love about this particular example is that one of Euler's key insights was that from, from the perspective of this problem, it doesn't matter where you go once you've crossed a bridge, you know, if you go onto the island and you walk around and you do some shopping, it doesn't matter what that is, because from the perspective of the problem, you're only concerned about which bridges you're trying to cross. So this idea of taking only the key information and throwing everything else away um, is something that I've, I really love, and uh, it's key to being able to actually solve problems. Um, this is an example of a fairly large graph. Uh, this was uh, Facebook doing some connections between uh, cities, and they uh, colored the <coughs> links between them more brightly if there were more pairs of people in those cities um, that had friendships with each other. Um, I also like this one because it shows where in the world is on Facebook and where it isn't. Um, uh, again, my neighborhood, um, I should say about that. Um, one other thing about graphs is that sometimes, actually there is something to say about that. In this one, you can go across the edges in either direction. Um, in this one, you can only go from one from point A to point B, and if you want to get back, you have to find another way to get back. Um, we call that kind of an edge a directed edge, and that kind of a graph is a directed graph, or a digraph for short. Um, social networks, I just included this slide to illustrate to my non-technical coworkers that you can attach information in a graph to either the edge or the node. Tree is a directed graph with some interesting properties that non-mathematicians don't really care about. Uh, this one I included because it's the, exactly the same as the family tree in structure. Um, it's just describing a very different problem. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, and I only included the visual thesaurus because when you look at it, you know it's completely obvious what it is, and you don't have to have any idea of what graph theory is. But it's also like, no translation is required to, to, to uh, think of it as a graph. Uh, it's sort of the, the mathy end of the continuum of graph theory. So, the point. Um, 
what I learned graph theory was a lot of fun. It changed the way that I looked at the world. Um, <laughs> and uh, once I had that perspective shift, um, I started to see graph theory in a bunch of different places. Um, and I thought that was a fun thing. Uh, and I was really, I was kind of upset when I learned graph theory that I was 27 or 28 years old and all of my life I had not known about this stuff. It was just kind of an accident that I that I wound up learning about it, and I was like, "Hey, this is really cool." I wanted to you know, walk up to people and say, "Hey, learn about this. It's great." Um, and I've gone on about graph theory in the in these slides because Git is really about manipulating graphs. Um, so having that tool set, in addition to being sort of a general thing that helps you look at lots of different problems, it also helps you think about Git. Uh, most of this power, as I said earlier, comes from the way that it looks at the world. Uh, once you understand that, it becomes much easier to use Git without feeling like you're going to shoot your foot off. Um, and again, uh, I wanted to throw this in just because it was a joke. Uh, because it was funny. Um, okay, so this is a screenshot of my uh, primary Rails application at work uh, from back in May of last year. The screenshot is from GitX. This is uh, Merge Hack. Um, and uh, I don't know, anybody have Git repositories that look like this? Okay. Um, so, yeah, um, the Git repository is a graph. Um, every commit in Git is a node in that graph. It's, it's a point in history where um, something happened that you care about and you attract it. You said, this is this version as of this point in time, and here's what's interesting about it. Um, and that, you know, unless you're, it's your very first one, that has some history that came before it. So nodes can obviously point to other nodes that they're based on. So you say, here's the initial state of the world, and then I made this change, and then I made this change, and then I made this change. Um, and of course, you can branch off, and that's time travel. Uh, <laughs> most commits point to one. You can have commits that point to two or more, hence the octa-cat that we've all seen. Um, actually, I, I think it was today, uh, possibly just an hour or two ago, uh, Michael Schwern gave this great talk at OSCON, or gave, again, this talk at OSCON, called Git for Ages 4 and Up, um, which is a great talk. You should go and watch it if you're at all shaky with Git. Um, and he... <laughs> this, the, I included this partly because it's a great link and it's worth watching the video, period. And partly because it's another example of this. It makes so much more sense when you understand X. Um, anyway, uh, go check it out. He uses Tinker Toys uh, to describe the state of the repository as, as he goes. Uh, it's great fun. Uh, the short version of that is that most Gitter operations do one of two things. They either add a node to the graph or they move a label around from one node to another node. Um, and when I say label, um, going back to the uh, Tinker Toy thing, he's got these structures that he makes out of Tinker Toys, and then these three by five index cards labeled like master and feature branch that um, as, as they type commands to make new commits in the graph, he takes these labels that are on you know, popsicle sticks and takes them off of one node and puts them on another node, and that's you know, the effect of doing git merge or git rebase or, or whatever. Um, this is a screenshot from git x, another one, a simpler one. Um, I, are there any non-Macs here? <laughs> I see one, one, two hands over there, three. All right. I saw somebody tweet earlier that this that this conference was like the best ad for Apple ever. <laughs> uh, so anyway, GitX um, it's great. I use it every day. Um, it uses four colors for its labels, um, where label means either a, uh, a branch or a tag. Um, when you're looking at it, it shows the current branch in orange. It shows uh, local branches in green. It shows remote branches in blue and yellow to indicate a tag. Um, and I'm going into this because uh, it's kind of relevant to the way that I, that I learned to get better using Git. 
Um, part of the reason that Git is horrible to learn is that it uses this random terminology and doesn't, it assumes that you know what it means. Um, local branch references move around uh, when you do things like git commit and git merge. Um, remote branch references move when you've done local stuff on your local repository and then you type git push. So that's saying, take the state of my world and make the state of that world over there be, be similar. Um, tag references don't move at all. Uh, okay. Um, sorry, it's been a good while since I gave this presentation. Um, there's this other concept of reachability. Um, so if you're looking at this graph and you're standing at H, uh, the history of the world that you can see is HGFBA. Um, if you're standing at, at E, you can't see H and vice versa. Um, so each of these are sort of like alternate universes. Um, is another fun way of thinking about it. Uh, and the reason that I mention this is that references um, are a way that you can sort of nail down parts of this graph. Um, References, which is to say a label, which is to say either a branch or a tag, um, are a way of making commits, which is to say nodes and the history that they depend on, um, something that you can get back to. Uh, the reason I mention this is that um, when I first started using Git, I was super paranoid about losing code. I would actually back up the entire directory before I did something I was worried about. Um, change to the parent directory, recursively copy the whole thing to a backup, go back in, do something that I thought was a little bit scary, um, confirm that it worked, and if I was happy with it, then I would go back up, delete the direct, delete the backup, and continue working, and if I screwed it up, then I always had that complete copy to go back to. Um, has anybody else done this, or is it just me? Oh, good, okay. Thank you for validating that. Um, I did that for like a year, until I finally realized that when I did those things, I was always worried about like what some merge was going to look like, or maybe I was playing around with rebase, um, which is kind of a dangerous command. Um, but I realized that I was always working on a branch when I did this. Branches are references, and references make commits reachable. So what I could do was create a new throwaway branch, you know, from wherever I am, git checkout dash b foo do whatever I was trying to do with that branch. If I screwed it up, then I could switch back to the original branch, delete the new one, and that history would eventually be garbage collected. Um, if I got it right, then all I had to do is say, git reset this to go over there, or do the merge, or whatever it was, um, and continue working. Um, that one thing saved me, well, first off, it saved me a lot of time, and, you know, cd dot dot, cp dash r, etc. And then it, it really helped me figure out what was actually going on and feel a lot more comfortable that even if I did something really dangerous, I could always get back to where I started. Um, and so this became the strategy that I would use, and this is why I spent a little bit of time talking about GitX in particular. Um, GitX lets you look at the state of the repository at a particular point in time. And then when you hit Command R to refresh, it goes back and updates the display and shows you the new state after you've done something weird. So what I started to do, and this is a strategy that um, you can either use yourself or teach people who are new to it. Um, you basically check out a new branch, and you know I consider that like a saved game. You look at GitX and how to visualize the, the part of the graph that you're interested in, and you really understand where what it's telling you, what each branch label is, um, and figure out what you want to do. Um, <laughs> do what you need to do, switch back to GitX, and before you hit refresh, you figure out in your head what it's supposed to change to after you hit refresh. So you say, well, if I was, you know, if I had this branch over here, this label here, and this this label here, and I did a merge, 
then I hope that this one has moved up and now it, you know, there's a new commit that points to both of those things that were there before. Um, so you figure out in advance what you expect to see when you hit refresh, and then you hit refresh. And then you have a chance to either say, ah, I was right, I've learned something, I'm able to make these predictions, or I didn't understand something correctly, and then you have a chance to figure out what was different, um, and what you, you know, what you, uh, you have a chance to learn something new. Um, <laughs> and that's really it. I, I had some um, uh, demos that I had prepared for my coworkers, but um, uh, I don't remember them at the moment, so I'm not going to try and do live coding on stage uh, completely unprepared. Uh, the slides for this talk are at thinklikeagit.heroic.com. So to try and paraphrase the question, um, it, the command line is sometimes hard to approach, and you're wondering if there are GUI tools or something that you can use to work with it in a different way, any alternate ways of representing it. Yeah, I mean, you use GIT, so it's just right. actually making the modifications instead of, you know, like sure. I you about learning the command line by looking at the graph representation in GIT. Um, I have just actually trained two non-technical co-workers to use Git Tower, um, and they seem to do reasonably well with that. Um, it's like $60, but um, they have a 30-day trial that you can play with. Git Tower, it's git-tower.com, T-O-W-E-R. Uh, anybody else have tools that they like? I just have a comment for the last question. You can also move labels around in GitX as well. Really cool. I don't do it personally. I can't. Oh, that the, the, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, the, the, the comment was that you can move labels around and get X, which I did not know. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, just quick on my power. I, I use it. I like it. Uh, I wish it had more features. <laughs> the comment was um, Tower is great, but I wish it had more features. Yeah. Um, in the back, in the yellow. Oh, um, Brother Bard for I saw something about that this morning. I was going to check it out. Thank you. Yeah. Um, did explaining it like this help uh, less technical people, like designers or front end developers, understand? Unfortunately, the two designers who I was really hoping I like wrote this for them, both of them were actually out that day. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, the question was, did this talk and did explaining it this way help less technical folks? And yes, it did. Um, I got great feedback from uh, the QA person, and you know, I don't want to say that the QA person is non-technical, but they're certainly less technical than the dev team. Um, I got great feedback from our product owner um, and from our sort of all-around admin person in the office that that was really helpful. Um, and those two people I've since trained to start using. 